Open your Bible. We're going to dance through some scripture this morning. Open your Bible to James chapter 4. Now, James was the oldest younger brother of Jesus. Jesus had four brothers, at least two sisters. After um, he was born, James became the bishop of the church of Jerusalem. Uh, they put him on the pinnacle of the temple and cried out to him, O thou the just to whom we ought to listen, tell us of Jesus. And they thought from that seven story height where they were about to push him off, that he would get intimidated and say, I wore me, his hand-me-downs and he had no halo and he, wasn't, he was just like the rest of us. But he cried out, oh, why, why do you ask me about the Son of Man? He sits himself at the right hand of the Father. A and the Pharisees turned to one another and said, we were wrong to permit such a testimony of Jesus. And they threw him from the pinnacle of the temple and even after the fall, he rose to his knees and began to pray. His knees, they said, at his death had huge calluses. They were like camel's knees because he had been seen in the temple praying on his knees so much for the salvation of the, uh, of the Jews. His book is one of the most powerful books in the New Testament. And I'm going to start right in the middle in chapter four, where he talks about prayer. Now, Lord, help me to communicate this in a clear, crisp, compelling way in Jesus' name. He asked this question. He says, where do the wars and the fights from among you come from? Where does interpersonal conflict come from? He says, it comes from your own lust. He doesn't mean sexual. He means desires for pleasure. That war inside of you. Hey, here's his point. Interpersonal conflict comes out of intrapersonal conflict. I end up having a fight, an argument with you, trying to satisfy something on the inside of me that isn't satisfied. The lack of peace between us is because there's a lack of peace inside of me. Pretty insightful, huh? He says the real problem here is that you have unsettled desires, things you want someone else to do to please you. And so we start asking other people to do for us what only God can do for us. He says, you, you have these desires and you don't have, so you murder. You, 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 you have these desires, you covet and you can't obtain, uh, so you fight and you war. And so he's saying this inner unsatisfied desire in us, I want something, I covet it, I can't get it, I can't obtain it, I don't have it, and so I end up being a killjoy. I end up ending the relationship, I end up uh, ministering death in some way to myself or to the relationship. And then he asks his interesting question. He says, um, he says, yet you don't have because you don't what? You don't pray. He said, have you prayed about it? Well, well, yes, I have prayed about it. Well, you, you did, but, but, but you didn't get anything? No, no, I didn't. God didn't answer my prayer. Well, 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 that may be because you're praying wrong. Kakos in the Greek. You're praying badly. Now, it doesn't mean a technique. It means you have the wrong motive. You're asking for the wrong thing. You're trying to ask God to fix up your life so it's more pleasurable for you, for, uh, for, for you. And then James really goes wild here. He calls us adulterers and adulteresses, not in a sexual sense, but here's what he says. You're too close to the world. You're having an affair with the world. And you are trying and thinking that the things of this world will satisfy you and please you, and you're asking God to help you get them. And, and he isn't doing it. He's not complicit in your, in, 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 in your request. If you're a friend of the world, you're going to be an enemy of God. Now, he, he, here's the deal. The, the real goal of prayer 
is not to get God to please you. The real goal of prayer is that you come to the place where God looks down and he said, that's my son, that's my daughter, I am so proud of them. The real deal in prayer is that I get to the point where the great push of my life is to please God, not to get him to please me. And, and, and then he says, and then he says a fascinating thing. He says, do you know, do you not know that the scripture says in Bain, uh, the spirit, capital, capital S, the Holy Spirit, who dwells inside of you yearns jealously. There are these yearnings deep down inside of you that you never get to. You never pray them. Because you're up here praying the superficial stuff, you never get to the point where the Holy Spirit gives voice to the deep yearnings that God has for you. And, and he said, this is a major problem with, you, with your prayer life. Go over, if you will, to Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. The Bible says that Jesus finishes teaching. He gets in the boat and he says, let's go over to the other side. Now, where are they going? They're going to the other side. But on the way to the other side, they had this storm. Have you ever had a storm come up on your way to the other side of something? And they end up in this storm. The Sea of Galilee sits in a little bowl. And because of the particular altitude, the particular place geographically, it has occasionally many tsunamis. And these tsunamis are such violence that they will take out structures within 50 yards of the shore. It just is a, a terrible kind of uh, uh, thing. And they're caught in one of these many tsunamis. And suddenly the boat is filling up with water. And, and, and where is Jesus? He's sleeping. He's sleeping in the boat. It's fascinating. He's asleep with the water sloshing everywhere. And they pray exactly what I pray and what you pray from time to time. Don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care that we're in the middle of a storm? Don't you care that life is being mean? Don't you care about what the doctor said? Don't you care that we're about to lose the house? Don't you care that the factory just closed? What's wrong with you, God, that you don't care about us? Jesus wakes up. He rebukes the wind. He speaks to the sea. Peace be still. And an incredible calm comes. The wind cease. There's a great calm. And then he says, why are you so afraid? And the Bible says, the Bible says, and they feared exceedingly. What they feared now was not the storm. What they feared was, what they feared was him. They get to the other side. He said they would. They land at a certain point and there's a man that immediately comes out of the tombs because they land in a graveyard. This man is naked. He wears no clothes. He has superhuman strength. They catch him. Occasionally they do these manhunts. Because he runs through not only the cemetery, but the park next door where your children used to play. They don't play there anymore. Because you don't want your children outside exposed to this crazy man. He screams in the night constantly. And though they catch him and chain him and bind him with his superhuman strength, he breaks these chains. He's a collage of scars because he's a cutter. Immediately when Jesus lands, he's the first one out of the boat. This man runs to him. He's conflicted. He begins to worship, but then there's another voice inside of him. An inner living, dying personality called legion who speaks out and says, why have you come, Jesus, son of the most high? I implore you, why have you come to torment me before my time? And the Bible said that Jesus speaks to legion and says, come out of the man. And, uh, and then the demonic host called Legion asks that they not be sent out of the country. They go into a herd of swine and the swine run headlong into the sea, preferring to die rather than have living inside of themselves what was living inside the man. It's really interesting what we tolerate as fallen, as fallen humans. The Bible says the whole city comes out and that when they saw what had happened and they saw the man sitting in his right mind clothed, uh, they were what? They were afraid. They were afraid of, they were afraid of Jesus. I want to go to one more passage and, uh, 
And, and, and I'll show you this passage, and I'll work through this a little different way. Look at verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Here's what the Bible says. We don't lose heart even though the outer man is perishing. What's the outer man doing? He's dying. There is no healing evangelist that specializes in wrinkles. Ball hair, fallen jowls, <coughs> or aging bodies. It doesn't happen. The outer man is it's dying, perishing. And, 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 you can't, and you can't stop it. But there's another process. These are two simultaneous processes. One is automatic and it's unstoppable. The other has to be nurtured, cultivated. The inner man is being what? Renewed, how? Not week by week at church, but day by day. One process is automatic. The outer man is dying. The other process you have to work on. You have to cultivate the growing of the inner man. Well, 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 well how, how, do you, how do you do that? Well, the light affliction, that's the outer man stuff, this is just a moment. But you can work it in such a way that it works a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And, and so here's the deal. You either focus on the light affliction that becomes heavier and heavier and heavier until you can't focus function in life, or you work on the inner man and you develop a heavier and heavier weight of God's glory on your life. Interesting idea, isn't it? But that only comes by cultivating, paying attention to the inner man. Well, how do you do that? He says, well, you have to look not at the things that are seen, that's the outer man, but you have to look at the things that are not seen. That's kind of like an optical illusion. You can't see the things that are so visible. You have to be able to see the things that are not, not visible. The spiritual, the intangible. You know, uh, <laughs> It's such, a, it's such a, a, a difficult thing to get old. Inside every old person uh, is, 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 a, is a young person saying, what just happened? Uh, and life goes so, life goes so, uh, so quickly. I went to my doctor and, and, and I told him I got this problem and I got this problem and I got this problem. And I asked him if they're related and he said he didn't know it. He gave me a green pill, blue pill, and a pink pill. And I said, I said, are, are these related or is this going to help me? He said, I don't know. Just try for a while and come back and see me. I said, is that why you call what you do a practice? I said, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, change is inevitable except when you're standing in front of a vineyard machine. The outer man is perishing. The inward man has to be renewed day by day. There is a treasure, verse 7, inside the clay jar, inside the earthen vessel. We pay attention to the clay jar instead of the treasure, the weight of glory on the inside. Now I want to show you something that's very, very fascinating. Paul says, we are hard pressed on every side, outer man in this world, but not crushed. He says, we are perplexed, but we are not in despair. He says, we are persecuted, but we're not alone. He says we are struck down, but we are not destroyed. He says we taste death, but then we can also taste resurrection power. And he's describing both processes. He's describing the outer man process, and he's describing the inner man process. Now, here's the deal. You can go through outer man stuff and never tap the inner man stuff. And if that happens, life gets worse and worse for you. You feel the issue of being hard pressed on every side. And then you are perplexed. You don't know what in the world you're going to do. And then you feel like you're being persecuted, picked out by some corporation or your job or something else. And then you're just knocked down, slapped about, and then you taste the death of something. But if you pray, if you spend time focusing on what you can't see, if you look beyond, if you ask God, what are 
are you doing? If you believe his hand is in your life, then what happens is another dynamic starts being loosed in your life. Even though you're hard pressed, you realize you're not crushed. You still got wiggle room. <laughs> hey, I, I, I'm okay. Even though you realize you're perplexed, you don't know what you're going to do. So the company's closing. That affected your 401k. So this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And, 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 and you never expected your child to come home and tell you and tell you this. But all of a sudden you realize that even though you're perplexed, you're not in despair. You, you just have this sense of assurance that God is going to do something here. He's going to do a miracle. This didn't take him by surprise. And even though you are persecuted, see, that's not hard pressed. That's not perplexed. That has fingerprints. That means that somebody, somebody, some personality, some demon, the devil himself is after you in a way. And he has your name on the crushing and your name on the perplexing. He is persecuting you, but that's when the Bible said, you realize you're not alone. You feel the presence of God. You sense that the Lord is with you. And even though you struck down for a moment, you lose your footing, you realize he meant to take me out, but I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. He didn't take me out. Uh, hallelujah. And even though you taste death, you taste resurrection power at the same time. Now here's what I'm saying to you. Here's what I'm saying to you. If all all you're praying is outer man stuff and it's never inner man stuff. You never wake up this inner vitality. You never wake up this inner dynamic. You never develop this inner strength. You never see the weightier, weightier dimension of the glory of God. See, God did not intend for you to carry the burdens of this world. That's why he allows you to do this thing called prayer requests. It's really an exchange. He says, what I want you to carry is my glory. What I want you to carry is my joy. What I want you to carry is my peace. I never created you. You are not made to bear the anxieties of this world. So here's what you do. You take all the outer stuff and you give it to him. And you say, this is your problem. I'm serving you. I'm dead, really. I've been crucified with Christ. You're living in my body. So if you want a roof over your head, you're better, you better find one quick for me. I'm going to trust you. What I'm worried about over here is carrying your glory in a way that despite all the outer stuff that's happening to me, people see a smile on my face, hear a song from my lips, and recognize the joy of the Lord in my life. Two different things. Outer storm, inner storm. Most of our praying is shallow. God fix it. Most of our praying is, I want you to make my life happier and easier. See, the thesis of the disciples was this. <clears throat> if you'll make the outer storm go away, then the inner storm will go away. They were wrong. They were wrong. The second story is not about a storm like the first the disciples were in. You see, the the problem was the outer storm got on the inside of the disciples. That was the problem. In the second story, you see a man with a storm who, that is inside of him that got on the outside. We, we keep thinking, if God will make our life peaceful and all the storms will go away, then we'll have peace inside of us. But what God wants is a people who have such a peace inside of them that they can go to sleep in the middle of a storm and they'll know everything is going to be all right. We've developed a kind of soft Christians in America. Not, not your church, but the one right down the road here. <laughs> Let me give you two names. Victor Frankel and Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow, Abraham Maslow has a, had a theory called the hierarchy of needs. I'm going to simplify it. But here was his theory. If you fix all the felt, measurable needs 
of mankind. You give them a place to stay, you make them safe, you give them something to eat. Oh, and by the way, you give them sex too, apart from marriage. If you fix all the outer needs of man, then, then he can deal with the inner man. Self-esteem, relationships. But he says you can't really focus on those if you don't know if your belly is hungry and, and, and those kind of things. You fix all the outer needs, fix the inner needs, psychosocial. Then he said you'll self-actualize. Now, of course, if you can't self-actualize, you don't need God. Hello? Abraham Maslow's sociology, Abraham Maslow's psychology became the theology of America in the 1960s. It drives our policies. It is really our theology. Fix all the outer stuff. Then you'll have people with inner peace and then people will self-actualize. Here's another guy. His name is Viktor Frankl. He's a Jewish psychiatrist. He ends up in a Nazi concentration camp. They don't take his life because they're intrigued by him. He watches these men the ones that run for the wire, the ones that hope to get mercilessly not shot, the ones that, the ones that, the ones that hope to get mercilessly, mercifully shot before they, before they reach the wire. He wonders why some give up their life and why some don't. And, 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 and he discovers that the difference between those that survive and the difference between those that live and survive having everything taken from them, including their name, when they're reduced to a number, is not the strength of their soup, whether or not they got an extra slice of bread, whether they got some kind of special treatment, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with something on the inside of those men called meaning. Now, he didn't believe there was meaning. He was an existentialist. So here's what he said. He said, you give life meaning. You, you ascribe to, uh, meaning to life, and then you tack it up like you would tack something up to midair. Here's the truth. There is meaning. There is purpose. There is a reason to live. God does have something for you to do. And, and, and Frankel was right in this sense. If you discover who you are in God, and you discover what God, and that he has something for you, and you discover his hand on your life, you can go through the harshest outer stuff because there's such an inner resilience and vitality on the inside of you that you can endure all kind of horrible things that happen. The truth is, it isn't outer inner. It's, it's inner outer. It isn't storm management praying that gets us down the road. It's inner person. It's the intrapersonal rather than the interpersonal. It's, it's not just managing this outer stuff. It's cultivating this inner stuff so that there's a strength and vitality. And see, this happens, what did the Bible say? Day by, not week by week. It happens day by day because you develop your own personal relationship with, with him. I'm almost finished with my introduction. <laughs> Do you know the two movies that have, uh, at least by some standards, gross more than any others? Gone with the Wind, the movie about the Yankees coming down here and burning out our beloved South. Kidding. I'm just kidding. And the Titanic. Why would a war story and a shipwreck, what kind of culture are we that a war story and a shipwreck would end up being the greatest grossing movies of all times. Why? Uh, 
underneath the shipwreck and the war story is about how love survives it all. You see, see you're, you're on a planet that the Bible says itself will burn at some point. You're on a ship that's going down and you're on a planet where there's war going on now more than any other time. How do you survive in a world like we live in? You gotta be in love. And see, prayer, we've made prayer a kind of duty. We've made prayer a hard thing. We made prayer a torturous thing. But when you begin to understand that prayer is the intimate time which you have with God where you let him love you and you love him, everything in your prayer life changes. Everything in your prayer life changes. But when, 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 when you really realize that every morning I shut my closet door and I get alone with God, and I love him and let him love me, everything in my life begins to change. Because I start looking not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. I start cultivating not the outer man, but the, but the inner man. I start pulling up the strength of this inner dynamic deep inside of me. I, I, I mentioned uh, David Wilkerson yesterday at the School of Prayer. I, I mentioned him because because of what God did in his life. He came in one Sunday night after preaching and, and he said to his wife, he sat in and watched the television. He said to his wife, Gwen, the next day, that the Holy Spirit whispered to him that if he would spend time in prayer that he spent watching television, there's no telling what God could do for him. Now, I don't like that idea at all. How about you? <clears throat> and I'm not trying to put any guilt on you, but he said to his wife, Gwen, I think God is calling me to something that I don't understand. I think God is calling me to, to seek him in a way that I've never sought him before and I don't think I can do it with the temptation of the television. Would you agree to get rid of it for a time so that I won't be struggling with it? And she, she was reluctant to do that. She said, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal. You put an ad in the paper and uh, if it sells within an hour, we'll, we'll both believe it was God. It, was, it wasn't going to sell within an hour. Tuesday morning, the ad went in the paper. 20 minutes after the paper's on the street, the telephone rang. 55 minutes after the uh, ad, after the paper was out, the person was standing on the front door and carrying out the television out of their house. Within an hour, it was, uh, it was gone. Two weeks later, David Wilkerson is all alone. His wife, Gwen, and the kids are away with uh, visiting with her parents. And when he would have been walking, watching television, he was walking the floor praying, walking the floor praying, walking the floor praying. There was a Life magazine there and he opened it up. There'd been a television, what would you have done? He would have probably turned it on. He opened it up. Double page picture, artist drawing of seven kids named the Dragons. They had knifed a 15-year-old by the name of Michael Farmer, a polio victim. They had each taken turns in stabbing him and then running the blood through their own hair. They were on trial in New York that Friday. He knew immediately he had to go to New York City, a place he had never gone before. He drove over there on Thursday, stayed in a hotel room. On Friday morning, he was in the courtroom when the dragons were being tried. He violated the bar trying to get to them, almost got himself arrested. I don't know if he ever had contact with them or not, but here's what happened. Six months to a year later, he was in New York. He'd rented a broken down apartment, threw a mattress on the floor, was walking the streets, and he was looking for kids like the seven dragons. I was preaching in Guayaquil, Ecuador. I told this story and a man came to me and he said, I was a 12 year old usher. The day that, Nick, that Nicky Cruz and the Mau Mau's and all the gangs of New York were challenged by David Wilkerson to come to the same auditorium. 
He said, we thought there'd be a bloodbath, all these gangs in the same place. And David Wilkerson stood up and preached to them. He pounded the pulpit and said, if you really want to be bold and brave, then stand up and follow Jesus Christ. Israel stood up. And then Nikki Cruz stood up and members of every gang in New York stood up and said, I'd like to follow Jesus Christ. Then the entire Mau Mau King uh, gang stood up and then gang members began to come forward. And that was the birth of what we know as Teen Challenge. Today, 14,000 were impacted around the world. Tomorrow, another 14,000 and another 14,000. Listen to James. The whole, do you not know that the Holy Spirit inside of you jealously yearns? You see, because we pray the storm management praying, because we pray the superficial praying, because all we do is pray about the things that we can see that are affecting our life, we never get to really praying this deeper stuff. Do you not know that the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of you jealously yearns? Do you not know that he has desires for you? Do you not know that he has longings for you? Do you not know he has a plan for you. Do you not know that he has a meaning and a purpose for your life that you've never even dreamed was possible? And like David Wilkerson, you're more likely to back into it. He, if he had known, if he had been a gang expert, he would have never gone to New York. You see, sometimes God calls us in our ignorance. Sometimes he helps us back into things we'd never do by ourselves because we're just so hungry to be used of him. And we're so deeply dependent upon him. We don't know what we're doing. That's why he called me, I think, to the prayer ministry. He said, you don't know nothing about it, so I'm going to just back you right into this depot, and you're never going to be able to get out, and that's where it's been for 25 years. God has something for you to do, and you'll never discover it Sunday morning by Sunday morning. You'll only discover it when you're by yourself with him all alone, and you suddenly you'll find yourself backing into the meaning and the purpose that he has for your life. You remember the moment in Titanic? You, you haven't seen the movie, have you? I mean, you are a holiness church. You don't go to movies, right? Uh, uh, you ever seen the moment when Kate Winslow is sitting on the upper deck with the linen and the fine china and the silverware and uh, and 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 the, her beau is next to her and her mother, they're dead poor, and her mother wants to use her to marry into wealth so they'll keep their status. And her beau really doesn't love her at all. And she's trapped into this choice for life. And she realizes her life's just gonna be one long line of meaningless parties, banter. And so she goes to the prow of the ship and she climbs over and she's about to jump in. And then the character played by Leonardo DiCaprio, lying on the bench, sits up, gets up. I wouldn't do that if I were you. That water so cold, it'd be like a thousand knives sticking into you. And then he starts taking off his coat. He starts taking off his shoes. Well, well what are you doing? Well, if you're going to jump in, then I'm going to have to jump in after you. This is the gospel. And that's what he did. He jumped in after you. He jumped in to this earth, born in a manger, come looking for you. There's a moment in which Kate is on the lifeboat and they're lowering it and and she sees him and she jumps off. And then they find one another and suddenly when the ship goes down, they're alone in the water. He finds a piece of floating debris and he puts her on it. It isn't large enough to support both of them. And he stays in the water next to her and holds on. And he keeps telling her that he loves her and he keeps giving her hope. And he keeps speaking promise into her life until he dies. And she lives this is the gospel. That he came to the shipwreck called the earth to give your life meaning and purpose. And you see, prayer is about a love relationship. 
It's not about a list of things where we're trying to tell him to fix our life to make it better and more pleasant. It's about reaching the point where the great desire of our life is to please him. And everything changes when you get there. Everything shifts when you get there. See, intimacy demands privacy. You can pray in your pickup truck, but intimacy demands privacy. You have to shut the door for that. You have to get all by yourself for that. You have to get along with the lover of your soul. You have to be transparent. You have to be other-focused and not self-focused. And when that kind of love happens to your life, that kind of experience happens to your life, something dead inside of you starts waking up and you begin to experience a level of Christianity that you did not know was possible. Would you stand?